It's Batman Forever versus Batman and Robin on Movie Feuds. What? Oh, really? Oh, my bad. It's Thor Ragnarok versus Thor Love and Thunder on Movie Feuds. Before I hammer home the pros and cons of these flicks, Jack Natalie Portman is off camera and she demands you subscribe to the channel Adam Does Movies so you don't miss a single episode of Movie Feuds going forward. Pretty sure those muscles are CG, but whatever, I'm still scared. Here's the deal, Thor Ragnarok not only introduced some colorful new characters to the MCU, but it also updated some of the originals, including the mighty Thor himself. Chris Hemsworth gets like 100% more comedic this outing. Taika Waititi directed the third and fourth picture, so the humor just makes sense. This director is very much known for his comedy. He also voices a new character in this named Korg. A fully CG never-ending story reject that will go on to get a bigger role in Love and Thunder. Our boy Hulk gets a bit of a makeover too, from both a personality standpoint and a visual one. It's fair to say that across the board, the Thor cast has livened up a bit. This is obviously a turnoff for fans wanting to see a more serious approach to the material. I found it to be a much needed change of pace from the somewhat dull earlier entries. Other notables include Jeff Goldblum pretending to play a different character. Mark, I keep getting worse as Bruce Banner Ruffalo. Butcher, the human equivalent of a portal gun. Bloodsport, that girl you wish you had a one night stand with in college but are kind of happy you didn't. Kansas is dust in the wind, and everyone's favorite brother that constantly dies, Loki. Surprise! Thor Love and Thunder sees the return of some of these characters, plus a good chunk of newcomers. The Guardians of the Galaxy get a nice glorified cameo early on, along with the return of everyone's favorite heroine, Jane Foster. Did I say everyone's? I meant no one's. It's not that Jane was previously unlikable, she was just super forgettable. She, Darcy, and Lady Sif make their exciting return to the Thor franchise with notable upgrades for Portman. She's now sporting a patched up Mjolnir and her own cool superhero costume. <laughs> she's gonna need it too, as she's going up against a god killer by the name of Gore. This Dark Knight is a visually menacing foe, and not nearly as easy on the eyes as Kate Blanchett's Hela. I didn't personally find him as threatening either, since most of his kills are done off camera. Meanwhile, we see Hela take out most of Asgard in the time it would take to order a cup of coffee. To be fair, Zeus could probably take out the Asgardians just as fast, if it was any other version besides the one played by Russell Crowe. Overall, we have a solid cast that's gonna live or die by the story. When we're first introduced to Thor and Ragnarok, he's having a pretty shit day. Suspending from a chain, chatting with the skeleton. It doesn't take long for him to turn things around though, and before you know it, he has slayed a god of flame and secured his skull back at his kingdom. Where Ragnarok opens with an impressive feat of strength by Sparkle Fingers, Love and Thunder does the same thing. This time though, it's played for laughs as the God of Thunder comically dispatches an alien threat and destroys a sacred temple in the process. Thor 3 does have a very comedic tone and definitely can undercut some of the more emotional weight of a scene, but Thor 4 is a full-blown comedy from beginning to end. It does have some serious moments, such as Jane Foster's cancer backstory or Gore's puzzling final wish, but these are very small moments in an otherwise very silly film. I mean, Freaking Tommy Boy had a dramatic moment, right? It can happen in comedies. Ragnarok definitely set the new tone, but the new entry ramped it up like 30 more percent. To many, this was the wrong direction. Back in Ragnarok, Thor's presumed dead brother Loki is very much not dead at all. In fact, he's the opposite of that. He's, al he's alive, and he's pretending to be Odin. This leads to the realization that their father has been off planet, living out his final days in peace. I mean, you can chalk it up to bad timing, but as soon as he Voldemort's away, Hella comes out to play. Sometimes I like to rhyme. Subscribe for rhyming. She's pissed, to say the least, about being locked up, and now wants to rule over Asgard or burn the place to the ground. Clearly someone's been working on their vision board. Her quest is very much one for power and glory, whereas Gore's is one for revenge. When he learns that the gods think less than nothing about their creation and won't help save his daughter, Gore goes on a killing spree. He then hatches a plan to kidnap a bunch of children in order to lure Thor in to show him where the magic fountain is hidden or something. Honestly, I found this whole thing to be very convoluted and bizarre. And the idea that there's just this magical fountain out there that can grant any wish was beyond convenient. Why didn't Thanos just save himself some time and heartache and just head over there? 
could have avoided all the shenanigans he had to go through. In Ragnarok, Hela could only be stopped after Thor realized he didn't need a special hammer or other device to best her. He just needed to dig deep and unlock his true potential. In Thor Love and Thunder, he needed a literal thunderbolt weapon from Zeus. Why does Zeus even have that? There are subplots aplenty in these flicks too. Planet Hulk, a Valkyrie story. Jane, blondes are more fun foster. A love triangle between Thor, Mjolnir, and Stormbreaker. The underutilized misadventures of the Asgardians of the Galaxy, and much more. Thor 4 has so much packed in that it could have been a Disney Plus series and probably should have been. It's not just the tone that got goofier, the entire production did as well. Thor 1 and 2 have a look to them, and that look screams, I'm not trying to be that memorable. Ragnarok gave the franchise an identity, for better and worse. The hero was definitely more interesting as a more carefree jokester, but there was definitely a line that needed to be drawn. Love and Thunder blew past that line and never looked back. Ragnarok still retained some darker aspects and at least attempted to creatively handle the material, whereas the new installment always looks and feels like the actors are in front of huge green screens. Nothing has weight to it from both an emotional standpoint and an action one. The lighting is downright embarrassing at times with cartoonish looking environments and costumes. Where Ragnarok felt fresh and revigorating, Love and Thunder already feels played out and disingenuous. Immigrant song matched the moment, acting as the perfect theme song of the film. Guns N' Roses is a badass group, I don't think anyone will deny that, but their songs didn't have the same impact Immigrant Song did, instead feeling like a large financial deal between Disney and band execs. And the whole thing this time around felt very commercialized. This type of thing will not bother a large amount of moviegoers, and frankly, I envy them. They will watch the flick and enjoy the living hell out of the humor and pageantry. Not ever thinking about the fact that there's an ice cream shop themed after the horrific events of Infinity War. Listen, I'm all about a dark sense of humor, but these ass guardians take it to an entirely different level. Have some sympathy for crying out loud. I've read some comments on the internet that state MCU fans got exactly what they deserved with Thor Love and Thunder stating that it's their own fault for propping Ragnarok up so high. I disagree. Ragnarok isn't perfect, but it's a damn good movie that gave life to a boring character. The tone wasn't always spot on, but it was a hell of a ride. I polled my audience, these are polls, via the YouTube community tab, and they agreed, giving Ragnarok an overwhelming 94% of the vote, leaving Thor Love and Thunder with a paltry 6%. Pathetic. Make sure to subscribe to my channel, Adam Does Movies, to take part in future voting, and make sure you don't miss a future episode. And remember, this is more than just reviews, this is Movie Feuds. Thank you very much for watching, this was a long time coming. I haven't done a Movie Feuds in almost a year. Uh, it's a big deal for me, as that used to be the flagship show on this channel. This is kind of a trial run to gauge interest, see if it's still there. And I couldn't do it without Patreons and YouTube joint members. So please think about joining me on Patreon at patreon.com slash adamdoesmovies or becoming a member right here. There's a button somewhere you can click on and, and you'll become a member. If you are one already, thank you very much. I appreciate you.